<laughs> um, and it's funny that that totally tees up my little my um, presentations a little. Thank you for that question. But it's a, it's really about the size of the entities and kind of what you want to do. Technically and practically speaking, there are simply filings that you'll do with the Secretary of State in your respective state. Um, so wherever your entity is originally formed. There's, there are options, there's paperwork that two entities can notify the state that they are basically going to become one new entity. And it's literally like a marriage. So there's an application, there are forms that you'll file with the state. If you're then doing business in multiple states where you've then registered as a foreign entity in those states, you'll have to update your registration in those other states that the two have become one. So sort of like um, and then you may change, they may change their name. Um, so if you think about it as a marriage, um, if two people were, you know, with, they're young, they don't have a lot of assets, they don't have kids, they don't have a lot of things and they get, you get married at 19 versus you get married at 55. It's more complicated to merge, you got to merge households, you got furniture. It's the same way with two businesses kind of coming together in a merger. The smaller or younger they are, the less complicated it is. The older or um, the larger the businesses are, it's a little more complicated. And so there are processes, there are you know your, your experts that you would work with, a business attorney, you'd work with your CPA, um, you might work with some other um, professional advisors to kind of help. And the amount of service you would need depends on the size of the entities and how old they are. But um, I'll kind of walk through that. So that is definitely where, as Tiffany said, when a merger, think of it as a marriage, when two come together, equal um, most often, but there could be, you know, 45%, 55% um, kind of situation, and you're creating a new entity. And legally, that can be effectuated by a formal merger where the two will, will, will come together. You'll change all the information with the Secretary of State. You'll have to change it with the IRS. You'll more likely than not be issued either a new EIN or you'll take over the EIN of one of the entities, just like stereotypically when a woman gets married, she changes her name. Her social security number stays the same, but she's got to change all of her ID. You've got to change everything with you know all of your paperwork. If we look at the most recent some of the recent mergers like T-Mobile and Sprint are going through one right now. And it's going to be a very long process. Um, here in Atlanta, SunTrust Bank is like historic, but they've merged with bb and and they are desperately trying to become Truist Bank. And they have been working behind the scenes. And now they are attempting to make that merger um, public, but there's a lot of long-term stuff that goes on behind the scenes if it's, it's a bigger entity. But smaller entities have to do, have to do it as well, just on a, on a, on a smaller scale. Um, so that's, that's generally the legal process for a merger. It's possible. You just have to plot and plan it and think through the best way to do it, talking with your CPA, talking with a business attorney and laying out the steps that take you from that single entity to basically a married um, entity. In some instances, the organizations will simply form a new entity and then dissolve themselves, which is kind of what happens with a merger. There's just a couple different ways that they can do it. An acquisition, as Tiffany mentioned, is more, I would think of it as an adoption. One entity is acquiring the other. So one is really going to um, take over more often than not, their, you know, their process is going to rule, their name's going to rule, their contracts, their sort of their way of doing business is what's going to um, survive versus a merger. It's often a mix. You like his couch, but you've got the bigger TV. He's got new plates, but you have a new bedroom set. And so you bring them together. Uh, an acquisition is more often you're just coming into my house and I'm gonna give you a couple drawers um, where you can put your stuff, but you're just moving, you know, your one bedroom into my four bedroom house because I'm more established and I'm, I'm, I'm bringing you in. And that's what happens with an acquisition. And that can be accomplished by either actually wholesale purchasing the entity and everything lock, stock and barrel with that entity, or you can purchase all of the assets of an entity 
or you can purchase all of just the shares. So, or can purchase a controlling interest in that entity. Maybe a person or another company comes in and purchases, you know, 51% of the stock. Or if there are multiple shareholders, they may only need to purchase 25% to have a controlling interest and to acquire that um, that entity. If you watch you know, any movies about Wall Street, they, they have these big like mergers or someone is taking over a company. And because there's so many shares and there's so many owners, you may only need to acquire a 10% interest in a business on a big scale and you now have a controlling interest. Where smaller businesses with less owners, you may need to acquire a 35% or 51%. It just sort of depends on how many people or how many entities already kind of own the shares. If it's just two people, you may just need 51% of that. Um, and there's, again, that legal process that you would go through to um, modify. In that situation, they may buy an entity and leave it as a wholly owned kind of subsidiary under the acquirer, or they may buy everything and dissolve the pre-existing entity and everything gets absorbed. Um, there are tax implications and legal implications and oftentimes financial implications into what strategy is taken. And these things can be done on small levels as well. So if you have a co-working space and there's another space that you guys are kind of aligned or, you know, maybe they're struggling or maybe separately everyone is, is, has great revenue, but your expenses are too high. And so it might make sense if the owners are on the same page to maybe merge and become one, um, one entity, then you can share expenses and now you can bring your costs down and now the revenue that wasn't enough to be profitable can all of a sudden be enough to be profitable simply because you're able to share costs and reduce costs because you are, everyone's not duplicating their expenses. And so that can happen on a smaller level, or you can take advantage of an opportunity with another business, another clothing line to expand. So instead of starting from scratch to add, you know, footwear to your line, you can acquire or merge or partner in some form or fashion with another company that's already doing footwear. And they've already got the design process down. They've already got manufacturers. They've already done all that legwork. And you guys just want to come together, share some costs and services, marketing and branding, and create something that's a larger without either of you needing to reinvent the wheel to get into each other's markets and become pet competitors in each other's markets versus working together and expanding your market um, together. So those are some ways that even on a smaller scale, you can replicate the, the same thing that bigger companies do. Um, the, the micro and macro applications are the same. It's just the, the number of digits are smaller <laughs> in, in those situations. Uh, and then the other type of legal setup that Tiffany talked about is a partnership. And that can be a situation where you can retain your individual legal identity, but then you'll come together either formally in a partnership agreement, a general partnership agreement, a limited liability partnership agreement, um, a joint venture agreement. There's so many structures and they each have a different legal implication to them. And it just can depend on your goals. And I would akin that if I keep with my relationship sort of analogy, that's you've decided to live together. We're not getting married. Everyone's going to keep their own name. Everyone's going to keep their own bank accounts or what have you. But we've decided that we want to live together. We're not getting married, but we're going to live together. And we're going to whatever extent we are going to work collectively. Um, you may sign a lease together, so you're both legally obligated. That's like a general partnership. <laughs> um, so there are different ways that you can do that. With the joint venture, it can be an actual formal joint venture where you create a new entity and you each are owners of that entity, or you can simply do a joint venture agreement where you just decide to work together um, for in per per into perpetuity, for a certain period of time, for a certain purpose, in a certain market, or to pursue a certain opportunity. It's really up to the parties 
how detailed and how involved they want to be. Just like, I guess, you know, negotiating a relationship. Are we exclusive? Are we not? Are we going to quarantine together? I know a lot of people, relationships either accelerated or ended with the quarantine because they were like, do I, I, it's been a couple of months. Do I like you enough to have to be stuck with you for the next three months? Uh, either yes or no. So I think a lot of relationship discussions were promulgated by the, um, by the uh, pandemic. So it's, it's kind of, you can define that relationship how you want to define it. And some of the frameworks, partnership agreements, as I've said, joint venture agreements, or you can have a, a more informal memorandum of understanding. Um, an example are Tiffany's business and my law firm. We've come together to create the Source Collective. We have our own memorandum of understanding that lays out what the goal is, dividing up responsibilities, dividing up sort of the um, sort of all of the tasks, benefits, and expenses for this effort together. But we are state two separate legal legal entities. Um, so there, you know, there are various ways that you can do it. Another example where smaller businesses may join forces in a joint venture to pursue a larger uh, market to pursue a larger customer where together they provide the range of services that are necessary to get that customer, whereas separately they may not have that range. Um, my firm has done that with um, other attorneys, both smaller firms and large firms. Sometimes we have a specific piece of expertise that the other firm doesn't have, but they have the client. So we'll join forces to service that client. Um, sometimes it's about capacity. Another smaller firm needs additional capacity to service a client or a matter, and we'll join forces in that way to do that, or we want to market together. So there, there are different ways that you can do it, and, and we you know, live those examples. Um, one of the, the next thing that kind of goes into whether or not it's a complicated process, any of these structures that you decide is you really have to have a plan to address the redundancies in your operations in order to get the benefit of it. Uh, particularly if you merge or you are look, particularly if there's a merger and acquisition. So that's understanding your staffing and workforce capacity and knowing whether or not your, the merger, the acquisition, the partnership is going to require some modification of that, that staffing and that workforce. It may be a reduction because you can be leaner um, and you won't need as many people because you're not going to be reinventing the wheel at each entity. And that can be part of, I said, the benefit. You cut your cost while you keep your revenue up and you've automatically increased your profit margin without increasing your sales, without increasing your, your uh, pricing or anything. Bring your cost down, you automatically increase that, that margin. So you'll have to look at, and this is where you expert, your experts may come in, um, what are your obligations to your workforce or staff? Are they 1099 independent contractors? And then you have to look at the terms of those contracts and how much flexibility you have and whether you, when you use those people, how often you use them or whether you can let those contracts expire or you need to terminate those contracts or create new contracts for the new entity. If they're employees, um, if you're going to make the difficult decision to reduce the workforce or move people into other positions, um, so looking at your capacity and how you need to adjust it if you join forces with another with another entity. Um, then on the other side, your vendor services, the organizations and entities that you get services from to support your business, suppliers, um, your phone, your internet, your location, if you guys are going to come together in one physical location. Does somebody have to get out of a lease? Does somebody have a property that they're, they're going to have to, to sell? Um, do you have two web designers? Do you have two merchant services accounts? Whose are you going to pick? Do you have two bank, banks? Are you going to go and put all the money into that one bank? Looking at all those costs, looking at all those providers, what are the terms of those contracts? Can you terminate them? Are they month to month? Do you, are you going to have to pay a penalty to get out of that contract? You look at all those things. And that implicates the, the cost to come together as well. Um, and what you can do once you kind of figure out those, those pieces, 
some of the benefits of just working together as businesses, you can then enter into a shared services agreement, which means you will either toggle between who pays for what, ex which entity pays for what expense with entity provides an expense that then is a benefit to everybody. You may get better pricing if you're able to buy in a higher bulk for the same supplies. I mean, office supplies or, or anything. If you go up in terms of your cell phone service, you may be able to get additional lines for free because now you guys need more lines as a unit and save money. Um, so you can do a shared services agreement where you basically say, we are going to we are gonna share these expenses. One person pays this, one person pays that. Maybe we have to reimburse each other. We true it up quarterly or what have you to make sure everybody's contributing fairly. Um, the next area that Tiffany alluded to and from the legal side, you wanna understand those liabilities. We already talked about the liabilities with your staff and workforce. We talked about your liabilities with your vendors. Then there are the not fun liabilities, which are any claims that are existing at the time, um, any potential claims that are out there. You know that there's a dispute that's brewing. You know that somebody slipped and fell at your location a couple months ago, and it's out there, and you don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, you are anticipating a business dispute, or there's something going on with the landlord of your leasing space. It's understanding if what those claims are, if they're out there, what's the status of them? What is the potential liability? Is insurance covering it? Are you paying out of pocket? Do you need to set aside money to resolve that? Um, do you, if you're, if you're coming together in some format, are you going to make sure that those liabilities stay separate? Are the new entities going to take on those liabilities? And sort of talking through those things. And, you know, sometimes you'll need a legal opinion on that. Sometimes it's talking with your insurance carrier if there's insurance coverage for it. Um, with, those, with those employment reductions, you may be looking at, you know, what are your severance obligations? What are your buyout obligations if you have employment contracts with folks? Um, employment, unemployment payments. Are you up to date on those? Is that going to come up if people, you know, make unemployment claims? And do you need to make sure you have some funds set aside to address those issues um, down the road? Lastly, as Tiffany talked about, there's a lot of funding options that are out there and there are different legal implications to them. Some of them, obviously, a commercial loan agreement. That's if you go to a standard bank um, for, for that funding. There are private loans where you can solicit individuals or there are investors, private investors that will fund um, as a loan. There are obviously, you know, government opportunities, government loans, SBA, looking into some as local options as well. Private funding groups. Everyone hears about that on the big level, private equity. But if you go to family and friends and you seek loans or you seek investments for your business, that's a private funding group. It can be informal. It can be at individual where each person enters into a loan agreement with you, or it can be a group thing where they form, they're in an entity, and then that entity invests, depending on the structure that is already in place. Um, there are people who put together groups of their friends to have their own investment groups and they loan money to businesses and loan money to, to people in opportunity. So you can look for those as well. In all of those situations, you need to be aware of the repayment options. So there can be, you know, your standard loan terms where there's going to be an interest, you're going to have a certain amount of time to pay it back. There are penalties if you don't. Um, usually in addition, there's, you know, promissory note, which is I promise to pay this back. Um, there are also what are called convertible notes, convertible promissory notes, where it starts as a loan, but there's a can be a trigger where either the person who loaned you the money can decide to turn that from a loan into equity in your business, or you may have the option, if you don't have the funds to pay them back after a certain time, to turn that from a loan into equity in the business. It just depends on how it's negotiated. Um, if a, I miss the owner can finance, and a lot of ways that can be done is it can be a standard loan that you pay back on those terms, or you can give them a share of profits, give them a share of revenue for a certain amount of time, 
for a certain percentage or up to a certain amount. And that's how you can pay to um, purchase, a, purchase a business that you're buying. In a lot of these situations, the debt may be secured either by the assets of the business or if you have to provide a personal guarantee, it may be secured by your assets. Um, so understanding how collateral can be used to fund that business, either the collateral of the business, if there are accounts payable or receivable that are really good, if there's equipment, if there's merchandise, that can be used as the collateral for the business. If not, you may have to use your personal assets um, kind of as collateral. And so those are some of the, the legal things that will come into play depending on which business and financial route you want to take. Uh, and these things, as I said, apply whether it's a large business that's going to take years like T-Mobile and Sprint coming together, or you decide to buy, you know, the co-working space on the other side of town because you're growing and this is a way to expand without starting from scratch, or you're looking to merge with another um, apparel company, but they're in a different space and you want to expand out without, again, reinventing the wheel. You'll, the same principles will apply, the same ideas. It's just the number of digits and commas in the, in the amounts and the amount of time it will take just is the only thing that changes. That's all I got. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I think I accidentally said uh, T-Mobile and Verizon. I meant T-Mobile and Sprint. <laughs> yes, and I've had Sprint since 1999, so I'm feeling like an identity crisis that I'm not going to have Sprint anymore. It's not going to be Sprint anymore. <laughs> so I'm I'm like, I don't like change. And I've had SunTrust since I moved to Atlanta in like 02. So yeah. And I don't like change, so I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling it. Well, I think bb and <laughs> is a wonderful company, so I think you'll be fine with the combination, although the name is kind of strange. Right, yeah. it's just like, really? I'm more about, I'm just lazy. I don't want to have to, like, change everything. I'm like the person that thinks at this point, if I get married, like, look, if, you, if he does the paperwork, I might change my name. But if I got to do all that paperwork... Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to say how much I really appreciated this talk. Um, the two of you have such a wealth of expertise between you. Um, I know that for us, for our issue is, is, you know, narrow, but it's definitely, I mean, compared to everything we went over today, it's narrow. Um, but it seems like it really fits in your wheelhouse. And I would look forward to um, consulting with you guys on some key issues that we're facing as a business. Oh, well, you got time, you, you know, if there are any questions now, ask away. You got time. Well, I reached out to Tiffany originally because I was doing research and I found an article that she wrote and then looked her up on LinkedIn. This was just a few weeks ago. So, um, you know, what I'd really like, I'm interested in partnerships, but I'm interested in something that I can't really find any precedent for, which is an equity share within a company that I'm providing services to. So okay. it's a little bit complicated. I don't understand why it wouldn't be possible. And I also, because I don't have a business degree, I don't know if it's just something I haven't come across yet. So that's, I'm really looking forward to getting Tiffany on the phone to talk through that. Okay. Is that a business that they are looking to compensate you through equity or you're just looking to invest in them in general? So I compensation through equity. So that is a key part of our revenue model that I want to explore because as we really build out this enterprise offering, like where we're d dealing directly with companies to provide our basically build family campuses on their corporate municipal and university campuses, I'd like to have a stake in the success of those companies because I feel like what we do is so integral to the success of their employees. And I'd, I'd like my, my own business to become really a wealth generating engine. And I think that if I can take as compensation equity, small amounts of equity in each of the companies who we partner with, mm -hmm. eventually that's an equity pool that my staff benefits from, that our investors benefit from. And it also gives everybody a, a sort of a system kind of lens on what we're doing. 
Oh, oh yes. yeah, that's absolutely possible. Yeah, that's absolutely Tiffany possible. can talk me through the, <laughs> that's yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. I yeah. thought it was a little nuts. <laughs> now, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of businesses, a lot of startups who are starting very lean, a lot of the ways that they will get services is by um, either get services in total or services at a reduced rate or get staff and get um, executives that they really want and they can't afford to pay them their market rate is by giving them equity. So that's, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I, I get that. And this is it's a little bit reversed in that we're the startup and they're the, you know, NASDAQ yeah. company. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. yeah. Yes, that's um that's there's actually a um there's an oil field services of all things oil field services consulting firm that actually has that model. They would consult to really? larger companies um on behalf of oil field development entities and um and so they would take a they didn't want to get in order to reduce the excuse me in order to reduce the amount of money that the oil field services entity had to pay the consulting firm what they did was take a an equity position in the larger corporation that was funding a lot of the oil field services entity so that if the company did well if that entity did well then the consulting firm did well and if that that's entity right. didn't do that's well exactly then right. they didn't but they got so they got some payment uh -huh. but they got a lot more of the upside so right. that yeah yeah okay. so i look i look i look forward to talking to you yay this is so cool i'm so excited okay this is why, yeah this is what i said i think this would be good for you to for you to hear <laughs> you were right so i'm so glad this was an hour very well spent thank you so much <laughs> you're you're welcome. Um, nice to meet you both. I have to hop off, but thanks so much. Okay. No problem. <laughs> thanks so Thank much. You. Um let's see. So Robert, do you have any questions? No, I don't. Um I mean my undergraduate degree is in marketing, so when you talk about partnerships, you kind of bring back, you know, memories. I mean back then, you know, you talk on a larger scale, but now that I'm kind of moving into an entrepreneurial role, I, it, it just brings back memories of other options that I can actually look at. So that was yeah. one of the reasons why I wanted to get on the call tonight to kind of refresh my memory and, and possibly think about doing some partnerships with other people. And, and here's the thing I want to point out because I worked, I remember working for Siebel back in, uh, what was that, two, early 2000. And I guess it had to be fairly early because then they were later acquired by Oracle. But anyways, <laughs> the and at that time there were all of these tech entities that would that would put all these press releases out about partnering. We're partnering. We're partnering. But they were paper partnerships. There were no there was no meat to them. It was just to get mind share. To it, there was nothing to them. So it was really nice to go work for Siebel and have those partnerships be substantive. We had agreements. We actually worked with software companies to integrate our software with theirs. We did go to market plans. We did, you know, we come up with costs and we would say, you pay for this, we pay for that. And we got so much out of those marketing partnerships. So the deeper the marketing partnership, the much the the more you can leverage that and really help you grow because we we were even though Siebel was the bigger company like in dealing with the the billing technology companies the in the energy industry and in the communications the telecom industry billing was huge and so that's how we got into those verticals and was and were able to grow significantly was through partnering with the billing entities and they were happy because then they could actually expand their footprint in other areas so they wanted to partner with us in energy but then they wanted to go like up and down and horizontal in energy and by working with us 
they were able to expand their footprint and we and we were able to go deeper into the energy company so it was a it was a win-win but that was a that was that was a case of the smaller entity really helping us right really helping the larger entity um and being basically integral to our growth okay so this, yeah that's partnerships just look at the ones where you can where you can work deeply or integra integrally with someone and really really build on that because if you're trying to grow that's how you're going to grow as opposed to doing this over partnering with this one over here for this this piece of marketing and that one over here you need to focus by focusing on just a, a couple two or three really key ones, you're going to get so much more out of it. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> no problem. All right. Go change the world, early. people. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. And yeah. as we said, we will um, email out to everyone who RSVP the um, PowerPoint from tonight. Yes, and okay, thank you. We, we may email to the two of you who were actually on on the on this recording. I mean, actually, uh, Roxanne and I will discuss actually emailing the um video, the video. Okay. <laughs> you ran out of words, right, you used yeah, all your I words like for the, the, the conference, the everything but <laughs> too many options. <laughs> <laughs> it's late. You run out of words for the day. You get a finite amount of words for the day. 